landed on D-Day, and from then on they start moving us up uh, closer to where the fighting was, and that's where I met Kowalski. Then when we got together uh, with F Company, our lieutenant, John Wine, said to me, well, said to all of us, if any of these, and if you, any of you guys are buddies and you want to stay together, just stay together. So I met this Kowalski about, a, I guess, four or five days a week before that, so we got to know each other, so we were buddies from then on until he got, until he got hit. Let me ask you one of sort of the bigger questions. I know that, uh, and I'm sure that you've you know, read a lot about the Hurricane Forest and know a whole lot more about it now than you did when you were... Yeah, because we didn't know where we were. Um, and, you know, as you know now, the ultimate objective there was they had to take the dams. Had to take the but at that time they didn't. That's where they were so dumb. See? That's what I say. What's his name? Miller. I ought to write a book about the dumb ideas. All they're worried about is the Hirsch and Forest and then them damn dams down at the bottom of the hill. If they'd have blew them dams up, they'd have flooded everything out and we'd have never got there. But they weren't worried about them. Well, how the hell did Coda know? He's back there with the Joy Boys. You know. They weren't worried about them dams and they were right over the hill from where we were. Because when you were in Kamerscheid and Schmidt, you could look down over the hill and see them. And they were, they were good size. But, uh, see, that's, uh, maybe that's West Point thinking. That ain't battle thinking, you know. See, they go everything according to the book. And if you look at the book, everything's still laid out, like I think since the Civil War, except they put the pictures of the World War I uniforms on the books that we had. So, uh, so, so, so you know, they, I don't care what anybody tells you, honey. You can say what you want. It's not the officers that figured that stuff out where the hell all the fighting was. It was the GIs. Because you went to... You fought where you thought it was the safest, you know. If they told you, go over here behind this house, I thought, what the hell with you? I think it's safer over here behind this tree. So you went behind the tree. If he wants to go behind the house, let him go behind the house to see if he can make it, you know. See, so... So when you were there at Kamerscheid and Schmidt and you could see the dams, did did you think at the time, gee, this is stupid, we should be going after the dams? Well, you see, at that time, you know, we're not engineers. We didn't know what all that dam involved. See, all we could see was just a bunch of water down there. See, that that's what surprised me whenever they kept saying about the Call River, the Call River, the Call River. Well, when I saw that dam, see, I thought, what the hell are you calling this a river for? Eight foot wide and eight inches deep, it's a river? And they, they were worrying about they couldn't get tanks across it? I thought, oh, man, you know. Uh, I, uh, and that's what they're all excited about. And like I said, this bridge, it's a concrete bridge about maybe 40, 50 feet long, and it's only a couple foot high across this little creek. Well, even if the tank caved the bridge in, it still wouldn't wouldn't have stopped the tank from going. And I, I, I can't understand what their thinking is, you know. I guess the generals back there with their paper figured this call river must be 90 feet deep or something like that, and I guess they figured the bridge must be 12 foot high. So, you see, they're doing it all on paper and scotch, and we're doing it with rifles and grenades, see, and they keep sending this stuff down there, you know, go down there. And I don't know, to me, to me myself, even though that, that call trail was a dumb place even to walk. Let, the only thing that could get down there was uh, like jeeps and weasels. And a weasel is like a, is like a truck on a tank, tra uh, tank tread, but it's open. It's like an open truck, like an open pickup truck, a big one. And that's the only thing you could go up and down that trail because it was so small. And it was so much mud that they even had the engineers there going down to the hill. They used to dig ditches so the mud would run like lava down off the road, down into the forest, so the jeeps could go up and down there. Because I've seen jeeps go down that call trail, and they were pushing the mud with the radiator, like as if it was a, a bulldozer. And they're going down this call trail. You know, so I don't know how they could expect to get big trucks down there. I guess they figured it must have been a boulevard, you know, according to their maps. You know, I mean, they got that all figured out statistically. 
So I was too dumb to be a statistician. So <laughs> that's why I never got bars, because I don't think I could have bars too long anyhow, because it threw me out for being a rabble rouser or something, or breaking the morale of all the officers. See, and they, what used to get me too, they get whiskey with their rations. Had a hell of a fight about that one time before we went to Vosnak. See, you weren't allowed to go anywhere by yourself, honey. You always had to have somebody go with you. Buddy system all the time. As like I say, when I used to go over the hill, I always used to get one of those guys to go with me, see. So one night the lieutenant said to me, I gotta get down to CP. He says, Come on with me. I said, Okay. We get down to CP and here they're all sitting around there drinking. They got scotch and gin and bourbon and I'm looking at where the hell did you get all this whiskey? They said, Oh, that's part of our ration. So the first thing they said to me, do you have any lemon powder? And we used to have these little, like Nescafe, it was lemon, lemonade. You put it in water and make a cup of lemonade. Well, they used to use that and mix it with gin and make Tom Collins. So they said, uh, you got any lemon powder? And I said, yeah. So I give them this lemon powder, and they says, well, do you want a drink? I says, well, naturally. Said, I'm only a PFC in the office. <laughs> so they give me a drink. And after a couple more, then I start getting riled up a little bit, and I said, how come you all drinking all this whiskey? They said, well, because it's part of our rations. I said, what do you mean part of your rations? They said, well, we get this issued to us. I said, why? They said, because, well, we're officers. I said, well, that's a hell of a note. I said, uh, we get shot just as easy as you guys. How come you get whiskey and we don't? They said, well, we don't know. I said, why don't you look into it? So, okay, so that night... We come back, I come back with the lieutenant. Next day the captain comes up with the jeep and he says, you went and get some beer? Yeah, okay. So he goes with the jeep, he comes up with a barrel of beer and he tells me, he says, now you get all the GIs lined up with their canteen cups and they'll all get free beer. And he said, I don't want to hear you bitching no more about whiskey. <laughs> so we got all free, we all got a free beer out of them. So that, that's all a, the highballs we got out of the officers. So. It's the least they could do. Yeah. Can, um, he said, we're going back to Bosnia. Well, okay. no, I won't go back to Bosnia, but I want you to, uh, you were in a couple places, you know, before and after. Yeah, we were in Kamashite. Can, can you compare fighting the Hurtling Forest to fighting the other places you were in? Well, uh, when you go through town, hun, uh, it's a lot different. Uh, because, uh, of course, they're hiding in houses, you know. But it's not too bad, because uh, when you go through town, see the guys on this side of the street shooting the windows on this side, and the guys on this side of the street shooting the windows on this side. To, in case anybody pops their head up, why, you know, you know that this buddy's going to watch me, because this guy might be above my head, see. Might drop a grenade or something. So they watch on that side, and you watch on that side. And then... In the town, it's a lot different than fighting in the woods because when they come running out to surrender, you can see that they're surrendering. They're not coming out with a rifle in their hands, see, or a burp gun, which we call a burp gun. It's, it's a German Tommy gun, see, and it, it's, it's a nice gun. We all used to fight for them, see, but then they took them away from us because uh, at night you, you couldn't tell whether they were GIs or German because you could tell the difference between their guns and ours, see? Their rifles sounded different, their burp guns sounded different from our Tommy guns. You could tell everything of theirs from ours, just the rifle, just by the way the bolts click. You could tell it was a German rifle, see? It, at, you at learn night, that, huh? At night you could tell? Yeah, it? yeah, just by the sound. See, because it gets pretty quiet at night. All you hear is crickets. And if a guy, uh, if a... Uh, guy snaps a bolt on a rifle, you can hear that. You'd be surprised. You could be from here out in the middle of the street, and you'll hear that click, and you can tell by the click whether it's American or, or German. Don't tell me how, but you do. You learn that pretty quick, see? So, so but, it's different fighting. It was different in the hurricane because forest condition. Oh, yeah. See, it was, uh, well, just imagine yourself, honey, it's a, uh, it's pitch dark. See, you can't see a thing. 
You can't see a hand in front of your face. I mean, if a man is in a foxhole 10 feet away from you and he gets hurt and you want to go over there and help him, you just kind of feel your way till you find him because you can't see him. See? And then when these big tanks start coming up, there's another problem. See, they got these big tiger tanks. They got tracks on them about three foot wide. And if they happen to come up on top of a foxhole, and if there's a guy in a foxhole, they'll just put this tank tread on top of this foxhole and they'll spin the tank around and it'll just bury that guy right in the foxhole. See, you kill as many, see in the army, you kill as many people as you can as fast as you can to break the morale. That's why they don't mind when they hurt you. Because every time they shoot you and they don't kill you, somebody's going to come and help you. So they eliminated two guys instead of one. See, they, they, you can figure all the angles out. <laughs> um, what was your what's the most frightening moment for you when you were in combat? Well, uh, I think the most frightening, like, like when you, the first fight you ever get into, because it's something you don't know what it is. And you build it up till it's so high that, geez, you're almost hysterical. You're so afraid. I guess it must be like the first time somebody throws you into a swimming pool. You're scared to death until your feet touch the bottom and there's nothing to it. You know, as long as the water's not over your head. And that's the way it feels in combat. And once you, uh, you get over that initial fear, then it doesn't bother you anymore, see? And that, that's why the new guys always stay with you because the, they figure, boy, he's brave. You're not brave. It's just nature does it to you. That's all. It, it, she just makes it that you're not afraid. That's all. I just, sure, I mean, deep down, you know, you, but you don't, you don't think uh, I'm going to get killed. Uh, but you know when you're going to get hurt. I knew two days before I got shot. Because my one buddy... After my regular buddy got hurt, this kid, he was still with our company, so he wasn't a new one. We're in a foxhole. This was in Vosnack. He said to me, Spark, he said, we got four days. I said, what? So we got four days. He said, why? He said, we're not out of here in four days. He said, we're not going to make it. I thought, oh, geez, of all things to talk about. But then before that, before the fourth day, he started getting writing paper and everything and putting it in his jacket and everything. I said, what the hell are you doing, bud? He says, this time when I get hurt and I go to the hospital, he says, I'm going to have writing paper to write home about. I said, what the hell do you mean when you go to the hospital? He says, when I get hurt. Oh, come on, you're not going to get hurt. What the hell are you talking about? Look how far we went already. You never get hurt. I'm telling you, Spark, when I get hurt, I'll have paper to write. Damn, the next day we get into battle, and I don't think he went 100 yards. He comes running past me. The bullet went through his shoulder, his arms hanging down like this. He says, what I tell you, Spark? So long, I'll see you. And he went back towards our lines, and I never saw the kid after that. He was a kid from Montana. I don't. All I know is his name was Jones, and we used to call him Bud. He was our uh, scout. We just call him Bud Jones. Now, how the hell you can find a kid in Montana named Bud Jones? I don't know. And then I knew two days before I got shot. What did you know? I just had a feeling. I said, something's going to happen, but I don't know what. It's going to be. I know. I knew I wasn't going to get killed. Don't tell me why. But I knew something was going to happen in about two minutes. Two or three minutes before I got shot, I remember they blew the whistle and we start running. And the last thing that went through my mind, I said, Last thing I remember, I just said, I think of my wife. No, I says, I love you, honey, but here goes nothing. About three minutes after that, I was shot. So the last thing I thought about was my wife. But I knew I was going to get hurt. But 
I knew I wasn't going to get killed. It was just something was going to happen to me. And don't tell me how you get that feeling. I don't know, but you do. And I, I talked to other guys, and they said the same thing. You know, that's like a lot of people say, "Well, gee, look at that guy. He's out there walking around in the open." You know, but you see, you don't, you don't think nothing of it. You know, like I say, you can hear the bullets going over your head, and you can hear them cracking and popping, and you see the shrapnel. Well, one time they were taking us. It was in the Hutchinson Forest. We were going through this fire break. We a fire break. They have a, a path through the woods in case there's a fire to keep it from spreading while there was a crossroads. And it was so dark that uh, you had to hold on to the guy in front of you. And just as we got to this fire break, the Germans dropped three mortar shells. Because every once in a while they just drop mortar shells in there for harassment, see, to, just to keep you on edge. And these things went boom, boom, boom. And just as they went off, I was the second guy in line. The first guy stepped in a rut in the road. When he stepped in the rut, a piece of shrapnel hit him across the forehead, and I felt the heat from the explosion hit me in the face, and the guy behind me, the concussion knocked him out cold. And when he fell, he fell into this mud, because the mud was like soup, and when we was walking, he, when he hit this wet mud, that's what brought him to. And he picked up his helmet, he found his helmet laying last time and he slammed it on his head because we didn't know this till day. <laughs> and we all got scattered. And finally when we all got together during the day, there was only about four of us out of this whole gang. And we started checking. Well, here this guy that got knocked out with a concussion when he picked his helmet up. It was all full of mud. When he put it on his head, it was all, all down. <laughs> and me... What I did, a piece of shrapnel cut about four inches off the corner of my field jacket, and another piece went right through my cartridge belt and cut five bullets in half. And I didn't even know it. Just, it, it goes so quick. So the next day we, we started checking up, I looked, oh, Jesus, look at my jacket. I knew it was there the day before, and then when I looked at my cartridge belt, I pulled out, here's these bullets all cut in half. I thought, damn, look how close. I mean, an inch away and I might have had my insides ripped out. So you see, you get, you get close ones all the time, honey. Same way in the, when we were going through Commerceite. We were going through this town. So my buddy and I decided to go through the backyards, jumping over the fences in these houses. My buddy jumped over the fence and went into the yard. And just as I went to jump over the fence, a bullet hit into the fence post right next to my elbow. So I flopped down on the ground. My buddy said, are you hit? And I says, no. I said, but somebody's shooting at me. He said, ah, hell, he said, that's those guys shooting between the houses. So yeah, that's right, too. So I got up the second time to jump over the fence, and another bullet hit in the same spot. And I flopped down again. And I says, Kowalski, I'm going to tell you something. Maybe that first one was between from the street, but that second one wasn't. So he says, well, okay. So he's standing under his apple tree, standing in the middle of the yard. And he's standing by this apple tree, and he's looking around like this to see if he could see where this guy was shooting. And here a bullet hit in this tree right next to his cheek. And he said to me, did you see that? He says, wonder where that son of a bitch is. <laughs> He started, he said, I'll shoot in the windows and you run. So he started shooting in all the windows at random, and I jumped up, and we run in front of the house, and we went out on the street. So we went out on the street, and the lieutenant said, what's going on? I said, God damn it, there's a guy in this house shooting out the back windows. So a tank came down the street. So I went behind the tank and picked up the towel, and I said, there's a guy in that house over there. He said, okay, stand back. So he told the guy. I had a cannon. He says, put a high explosive in there. And boy, he shot that house. We were about 50 feet away. And when that cannon hit that house, it made out of big blocks like this. It just came and all in. He said, well, I don't think he'll bother you anymore. So we continued on through the town. <laughs> so you see, you get close ones all the time, huh? But it, after a while, it doesn't bother you. So, What were you trying to do in Commerce Shite? What was the... What was we're capturing the town. See? These guys were coming out of the basements and stuff and surrendering, and so uh, 
So when they surrender, you know, just come and go back towards our line to the prison cage and see them. Like all our guys. Like this one kid. <laughs> His father was an undertaker. And he used to rob them. Rob them all! Rob them all, Sparkle. So I ain't touching them dead krauts. He says, it won't hurt you. He used to rob them. One time we get in this battle and he shouted, a uh, German lieutenant. Boy, and this guy all dressed up and stepped right out of band box, you know. White shirt, black tie, pressed pants. So this guy was on the ground trying to get up on his knees. And my buddy said to the lieutenant, what do you want me to do with this guy? He said, oh, take him to the prison cage. Hell, I'm not going all the way back there. He said, that's a quarter of a mile away. So the lieutenant said, well, I don't know what the hell to do with him. He said, oh, I guess I might as well shoot him. And this German could understand German, or understand American. And he says, you can't shoot me, you can't shoot me, Geneva Convention, Geneva Convention. So blown, he says, Geneva Convention, hell. He says, so long, and popped him, and the guy flopped on his back, and just that quick he reached in his pocket and said to me, look at that roll of money. Great <laughs> big roll of money like that. He robbed them all. One day he's thrashing around in the dark. And I said, what's going on out there? This is Blondie. I said, what the hell are you doing out there, Blondie? He says, I'm trying to find my pack. I said, well, what are you, what are you worried about a little thing like a pack for? I said, I'll give you another one. He said, yeah. He said, but my pack had 20 watches in it that he stole from the Germans. <laughs> See, that's why I never bothered him. See, that was before they shot this buddy of ours, Smitty. So, uh, Kawasi, he, or, uh, uh, Blondie, he was, uh, he was hard, he used to shoot them all, you know. He used to shoot them all the hell with him. Uh, captured a couple of Germans said to him, take them back to the prison cage. He said, okay. Takes them back. About five minutes later, he's back. I said, did you take them to the prison cage, Blondie? He said, what the hell's the matter with you? He says, through all that artillery fire? He says, they're over there in a the ditch. <laughs> okay, if that's where they are, that's where they are, dude. But you don't think nothing of it, hon, you know. I mean, you're not killing a man. You're shooting a target with a green uniform. You know, that's the way you look at it. I mean, you know, like quick draw McGraw, you got to be the first on the, on the trigger. You, you don't get no second chances. How do you look at it now? Well, uh, I'm not mad at him. I was never mad at him, because uh, the way I looked at it, uh, they were the same as me. They were fighting because they had to, not because they wanted to. So uh, if they didn't, well, of course, they were heartless in their army. If they didn't do what they told them to do, they'd shoot them, you know. So uh, I figured, hell, they're just plain old GIs like us, take their uniform off, and you can't tell the difference anyhow. Like I always told my kids, Jesus, if we ever have another war, make everybody fight naked. Who the hell are you going to shoot? We fought them because they had a green uniform, and they fought us because we had a brown uniform. You know, so what are you going to do? See? Then they had a lot of these guys that dressed up in GI uniforms. See? The one time they had us in Germander. That was before we went to Vosnag. They had us out on a the roadblock there. It was my turn to stand guard duty, and these two English scout cars come down. And the one stopped by me, and the other one was about 100 yards up the road. I guess he was covering them. That's the way you always do. So I jumped up on his scout car. It's like a little Jeep, but it's like a little armored car. There was two guys in there, and they were uh, limeys, because it was an English scout car. See, they had limey uniforms on. So this guy said, hi, Yank. I was hi. He says, uh, where's your headquarters company? That's the first thing he said to me. And I thought, uh-oh. I says, back there. He said, I said, down there about a half a mile in the woods, but our headquarters company was over here. See, I wasn't going to tell where we are. So I'm looking down in there, and this guy had a pair of these gloves on with, like, gauntlets, you know, the leather like the old-time chauffeurs used to wear. So I said to him, Hey, Mac, is uh, them gloves G.I.? He says, What? He says, I says, Are those gloves G.I.? He says, uh, I don't rightly understand. I said, You know, 
Are those army gloves? Oh, he says, you mean service issue. I said, yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So then he had a, a grease gun in there. That's when we got our new little Tommy guns. We used to call them a grease gun because they looked just like a grease gun in a gas station. I said, when did you get the grease gun? What? When did you get the grease gun? He said, I don't rightly understand. I said, over there, and I pointed towards the grease gun. Oh, oh, yeah, he said, that was just issued to us, too. So I said, oh. Well, he says, I guess I'll be pushing off. I said, okay, and I left them go. Well, as soon as they left, I got on the radio, and I said, are there supposed to be two English scout cars up here in our sector? I said, no. I said, well, two of them just went by. Here comes the P-51, and away they went. See, there was Germans. They were dressed in English uniforms. But see, when he didn't know what the GI meant, I thought, oh, ho, this is something fishy here, see? So that's what you do, you know, you ask stupid-ass questions like that. The same way every night you had a, had a password. Say, in case come, somebody come by in the dark, you'd ask them what the password is, and they'd give you a password. Well, when he gave you a password, then you had to give him a countersign, see? So, uh, see, now, well, like if I said to you, what's the... What's the password? You'd say tablespoon, or maybe something like that. See, a tablespoon. Then you'd say to me, well, what's the countersign? I'd say a fork. See, so it was two different words altogether. So if, if, if I said spoon, he knew I was American, and if he said tablespoon, I knew he was American. But we used to use a lot of words that were hard for Germans to pronounce. See, like worsted. See, it's hard for a German to say worsted. So if they were saying they were America, you know, uh, infiltrating the lines or something. Well, if they if they couldn't say worse, then we know damn well they weren't Americans. See, that's see. rolling again. So I think the first thing I want to ask is, um, is if, if you can think back to when you withdrew from Bosnak. Yeah. Carolyn and I uh, are are referring to at the far side of the town, overlooking the valley. Yeah, that's where uh, we Schmidt, are. Schmidt Over the other side. Yeah, because we watched them capture Schmidt. Okay. We remember, or we were told, that there were a lot of, there was a, a line of foxholes out there basically in the open. Yeah, that's where we were. And you were in the, okay, yeah. well, if you can maybe just re, re, recant, talk to us again about what you remember about that withdrawal, what started it, and where you went back. And I think you told us you stopped at the church. Yeah, right? well, see, I don't, I don't remember no. what caused the withdrawal, but uh, I just remember somebody said we're pulling back. So Okay. Th Do you remember if there was, if we'll in return? Yeah, okay. getting started. Uh, well, to start there again, and maybe while you're talking to Carolyn about it, do you remember, was there any pressure from the Germans? Or? No. I, 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 hang back in the chair. Oh, uh, uh, I think, yeah, when they or said... Actually, let me ask you, why don't you just talk about where those yeah, well, souls were, how they were out in the open, and I think yeah. there was even some direct fire on you guys. Wasn't yeah, well, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, let's shoot at you within yeah, 80. Tell her, tell her about the... You know, oh, uh, see that... Uh, that shoot you at you with these 88s. And what that was, an 88 millimeter gun. The Germans originated that during World War I for an anti-aircraft gun. But then they found out it was like a rifle. It could shoot straight. So they'd shoot that at you. And the only thing is, with an artillery shell, you could hear it coming. With an 88, all you heard was a zip bang. So it just sounded like somebody pulled up a zipper and bang. Because just in a matter of a half a second from when they shot at they shot at you, and they used that. If there was two guys walking down the road, they'd shoot at them with an 88, a big shell like this. See, but uh, like this, going back to this Vosnak, yeah, when we got out of town, there was a, it went way down a, a big valley, uh, and we were at the edge of this. I guess they call it the perimeter in the army. We just call it the edge of the field. And we could see down in this valley, and on this side was the forest. And after we got beat up so bad, uh, I guess everybody was ready to run. And when somebody said, we're going to retreat, <laughs> boy, when one guy jumped out of a foxhole, <laughs> everybody just went with him. You know, we didn't know. We run so fast, we didn't even bother looking back to see if there were Germans. We took it for granted they were. <laughs> That's why we just run clear back to the end of town, into the middle of town. Then we went on towards, uh, 
I guess that goes towards the karma shite that, that on that direction from. But before they told when they told before they told you you could move back, you were taking heavy fire from the ridge, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. see, they were on the other on the other hill. See, we were right out in the open, hun. See, that's wh that's why you never put your head out of the foxhole during the day. I mean, if you had to go to the bathroom during the day, tough. You got to hang tough. Because once you step out of that foxhole, you ain't never going to get back in. And then they had snipers, see? Now, after my buddy got hit, I was in a foxhole with my sergeant, Sergeant Veliki. And he had a pair of binoculars. And he's uh, looking out of the foxhole just this much with a pair of binoculars. And we figured this, the edge of this woods must have been about a thousand yards from where we are, because this valley was just like a cow pasture, no bushes or anything. And he's there looking around, and this sniper must have saw the flash of the light. And he's looking, all of a sudden, bing, a bullet hits the, a stone just about three inches from his cheek. And a piece of the stone flew up and cut his cheek. And he just sunk down in the foxhole alongside of me, and the only thing he said was, that son of a bitch is good. That's all he said. Because if that guy misses you that much, from a thousand yards away, he don't miss very often. But that was the only, the only wound he got, and he went through the whole battle. I mean, he went through the whole war. In fact, uh, he was home on a furlough. They sent him home for 30 days. He was on his way back to join the outfit. And they were in the middle of the ocean when it was VE day, so they just turned the ship around and brought them all back home. Because... Uh, Yes, just Sparkin, I, I know uh, pretty much what you think of the guys back at division headquarters and higher. Do you think you the company of great officers that you uh, served with did they uh, did they lead you well? Do you think? Uh, well, I'll tell you. I think Lieutenant did, Kaufman and Lieutenant Crane were there, and, most uh, and, and, and wine wine was ours. Mm -hmm. Wine was our uh, yeah, lieutenant. Talk to oh, uh, we never saw too many of them, but the, but the only one we saw. Most was Wine and Kaufman, because at that time, our captain got hurt, and Kaufman was the acting captain at that time, because he was the first lieutenant, see? And Wine was the second lieutenant. And then right before we got to Wozniak, Wine got promoted to a first lieutenant. And I'll never forget that, because he said to me, Damn, Spark, what do you think? He says, I got promoted to a first lieutenant, and they don't even have any silver bars to give me. And I told him, well, hell, go down and see Jerry. Jerry was our uh, medic. And I says, get a piece of white adhesive tape and tape that brass over and you'll have a helmet of silver bar. He said, yeah, I never thought about that. So. It sounds like you liked some of these guys. Eh? They, I mean, they were pretty uh, pretty close to the action with you all the time, weren't they, the officers? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, our wine stayed right. He, was, he led us. I'll give him credit for that. Wine was a good guy in a fight. Because he told us what we were going to do. But him and I used to get in some arguments, too. Like like the day I got shot. They said, well, we're going to put up a a barrage, a five-minute barrage, and then we're going to attack these pillboxes. And the first thing I said to him, well, why do we get a flamethrower? He said, they don't have any. I said, well, gee, do they have a bazooka? At least a bazooka will help. They don't have any. Jeez, you mean all us guys with bare rifles and me with this bomb are going to attack these pillboxes? He said, well, we're going to get, get the barrage. I said, but we're not going to walk through the barrage. But that's all it was. I mean, see, that's what I mean about Miller with the, with the dumb ideas. Can you imagine you trying to attack the guy behind an eight-foot wall with a rifle? Hell, they must have gave, might have given us a, a handful of tennis balls. That's about all the, all the good our rifles were. You see, meat is cheap to them. See, so. You so say you think, by and large, your platoon leaders were were effective. Do you think? Oh yeah, our our sergeant Velicky was a good one because a couple of times I saw him tell. Talk, talk oh, a couple of times I even saw him tell wine off. See, you get into an argument. The hell you are! That, that's not the way to do it, and that's not the way we're going to do it. Now you listen to me, and this is what we're going to do. So said, well, yeah, well, okay. He said, okay, that's what we're going to do. Do it this way. See? Because them guys have a lot of combat experience, too. You know, you don't get them stripes. From, well, we got our stripes by seniority. 
So we had no corporals. Like I was a PFC. The day I got shot, if I wouldn't have got shot that day, I'd have been a sergeant because our sergeant got shot that day. So I'd have been a sergeant that afternoon if I'd have made it. <laughs> but, but since I was a PFC, I had the same thing as a sergeant. He used to tell me to do this and do that. I used to tell him, I said, well, geez, I'm no sergeant. What do I have to do this? You know, take these guys on a patrol, take these guys and go ammunition, take these guys back to the aid station. I said, I don't have any stripes. So he said, yeah, but he said, you, you got the combat experience. You know what we're supposed to do. Because I was a PFC for about three months. So one, one day he said to me, you, you have to learn how to address your mail. I said, how are you going to tell me I don't even know how to spell my name? He said, well, you're a PFC. I said, Jesus, when did that happen? He said, a couple months ago. I said, oh, well, thank, thanks for the rank. So the next day the sergeant came and gave me two sets of stripes. I said, now what do I do with these? He said, put one on your underwear and one on your raincoat. So what we did, we just put a stripe on with a pencil. That was, that was our stripes. Our sergeant had three and a half stripes with a, with a pencil. That's all the stripes we had. But we didn't believe in that stuff. Ms. Parker, do you think you were a pretty good, uh, I, I know you took uh, more than your fair share of casualties because of the, you know, the, the fact that you had a pretty good opponent and it was difficult there, but do you think you were a pretty good unit, at least down at, like, the platoon and the company level? And, and tell Carolyn about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, ours was a good outfit. I'll, I'll say one thing. It, the guys all stuck together, and it, it didn't take long for the new guys to catch on. Like I say, uh, you know, 30 seconds of fight and you're a, you're, you're a combat veteran. Because I remember one time we got in one fight and we had three sergeants within 10 minutes. The one didn't even get 50 feet. In fact, we met him the night before. And he said, well, it's getting too dark for me to meet all you guys. I'll, uh, I'll meet you all in the morning. So in the morning we went out, started this combat, and we got down about 50 feet. And my buddy looked at me and he says, hey, Spark, he says, is that our sergeant? And I said, yeah. Geez, wonder what his name was. And we get down about a, a hundred yards, and there's another one. And he says, "Hey, Spark, he said, our so you know, yes, yeah, I, I don't know him either." So we had three of them. So you see how quick you learn. It's I heard that that kind of story more frequently about new replacements. Well, yeah, see the, the, the see the new replacements, hun. The hardest part is get them to move. Keep moving, because it's harder to shoot a target when it's moving. And when it's laying still, see, and if you lay down on the ground, man, you're 99% dead right there, see. So at least if you're zigzagging or doing something, at least walking. Because, see, they're as nervous as you are, and they're, they're trying to shoot too, you know. I mean, you, you don't kill a guy with every shot, see. But that's what you have to learn, see. If you see a guy running in front of you, you don't shoot at the guy, it depends. Now, if he's 100 yards in front of you, you shoot maybe a, a foot in front of him. By the time he goes that extra foot, that bullet's there at the same time. See? If you shoot at him now, in that, that much of a second, he already stepped out of that line of fire and you missed him. See, and that, you learn that by... Well, in the Army, they always used to tell us, don't shoot Kentucky windage. And what they mean by Kentucky windage, if you shoot and you don't hit the target. If, say, for instance, every bullet goes to the right of the target, you have to adjust your sight to make it go to the right to hit the target right in the middle. Well, when you shoot Kentucky windage, if you shoot at this target and you miss it by two inches, you don't move the sights. You just move the rifle over two more inches and shoot two inches on the other side of the target, and then it'll hit the target in the middle. That's what we used to call Kentucky windage. And you learn that, well... I had my first rifle when I was about 12 years old. And you learn that without even thinking, you know, you, you just almost do it by instinct. Like one time we were going through this town, I think it was Kamerscheid, and there was a house there. And we were across the street, going down the street, and these big double doors was open, and there was a great big crystal chandelier hanging there. That thing must have been about four foot tall, and oh, it must have been about three foot wide. Gorgeous chandelier. <laughs> and I said to my buddy, I says, Kowalski, look at that chandelier. <laughs> he says, get it. And just like that, I just 
took a snapshot, and wow, that thing flew in about 10,000 pieces. When it hit, it just shattered. Never, that crystal's just flying off. <laughs> the hell, whoever there in the house didn't know who did it. So, you know, that was, I, I just felt good because I, I did something to them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but yeah, That kind of reminds you, do you think the, do you, did you have a lot of respect at the time for the Germans as, uh, as uh, you know, I got, as opponents, I guess? Or? Oh, uh, oh yeah. I mean, you know, you you, you had to show them respect because uh, they were uh, they were out to kill you just as fast as you were to kill them. You know, but then uh, when they, when they give up, they're pretty timid. You'd be the same way. You know, like when your dad whips you, that's enough. That's enough. You know, and when they got their hands up and he got me, please don't kill me, don't kill me. You know, so you figure, well, why should I hurt the guy? You know, I mean, he, he's not going to hurt me. So, you know, so. Did you have a fair, do, you, do you remember much close combat where you could see the guys you were? Uh, well, that, that, that the only thing that, that that happened in the first battle we were in, too. I'll never forget that. Go wine says, okay, fix bayonets. And boy, I'll tell you, when he fits, said that, my heart went up to here, and I felt a 25-pound block of ice in my chest. I thought, oh, Lord, I don't mind shooting them, but Jesus, don't let me get close enough where I have to stab them. So I always made sure that I had <laughs> bullets in my gun. When I, I, every time I shot him, I counted one, two, three, four, five. When I got down, I only had about two hundred. Bing, bing, and I hurry up and put a fresh magazine in there because I wasn't going to let that guy get within five foot of me. I don't care what I had. To do. I was going to shoot him if he was only two feet away because I wouldn't have the heart to, to stab a guy with a with a knife. Even to this day, I, I wouldn't have the heart to shoot a rabbit. No. Like all these happy-go-lucky hunters. I wonder how many of them would go hunting if the deer carried a rifle. I'd like to see that. Uh, did, did, yeah. did, uh, did you get into a close fight that day? No, never that close. We, ne we never got... Even like we went house to house, you know, they popped out the doors before you got there so you could have a chance to see them. You know, if they jumped out real close in front of you, you didn't... You just shot by instinct without even thinking, because you did it so quick, you know. Because the first thing you popped into your mind, he's going to kill me, I better shoot him, you know. And just pray to God it's not a GI, you know. But a, you got to think, well, a GI wouldn't go through the house anyhow, you know. So you, you, all this goes through your mind. It, uh, you kind of, little by little, you put stuff in there and you kind of save it, you know. And that's what you keep trying to. Tell the new guys, you know, that, well, you know, uh, what I do here, I said, Gee, you know, follow me, but don't do what I do, J you know, uh, get some idea, just don't, don't stop or don't, don't uh, lay down, you know, just keep moving all the time, keep moving, but if, if they don't move, well, you know, I mean, it's easier to shoot the Statue of Liberty than it is a guy walking on the sidewalk, you know. But you see, they get so afraid, they get paralyzed. They're afraid to shoot because I guess they're afraid to hurt somebody, see? But once you hear them bullets popping and really puts the icing on the cake, when you see one of your guys fall, so, oh, man, you can't do that to my friends. That's, that's the time when you hate them, you know. Then later on you figure, well, you know, that's, that's the way the rules of the game, so. Is that, is that why you think... Most guys fight because they're trying to take care of their buddies and protect Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's the same thing, hon. I mean, uh, now, if, if my buddy got hit and he was 50 feet away, and if I had one chance in a thousand to go over there and get him and drag him to safety, that's good odds. You wouldn't even give out a second thought. you just run over there because he's your buddy. you got to get him. You ain't going to leave my buddy lay there. I don't care well, what the hell they're doing. I'm going to get him and try to get him out of here. And you just do that, you know, without thinking, because he's, you know, because I know he'd do the same for me. See? Because you get close. Boy, you get close. And you're like a father and a son, you know, because I watch over him and he watches over me. Because he watches over my shoulder and I watch over him. See, a lot of times at night you start... You stand guard duty, you stand back to back. Because a lot of them Germans, like in the Hirschen Forest, they'd sneak around in the dark and they'd
put a piano wire around your neck and strangle you while you were standing there. See, that piano wire is real thin. They have it like a stick on each end. Another thing, they used to put a piano wire across the road. And the jeeps always rode with their windshields down, see. And the jeep would come flying down the road, and this piano wire would just decapitate them. So what they did on the jeeps, somebody in an ordinance got the bright idea. They got a little piece of angle iron, it's about one by one angle iron, and welded it on the bumper of the jeep and put it up so it stood about an inch above the driver's head. So if he hit this wire, it would go up to the, to the end of this thing, and there was a hook cut on the end of it. So this hook would just get this wire and break it off. And that way it wouldn't cut the guy's head off. See, you learn quick. See, so we uh, But like something like that, the guys on the Jeep, they'd have to do that to the Jeep themselves. It wasn't... Well, no, they'd take it back to, uh, like, ordinance where they repair stuff. See, the repair stuff's not too far away. I mean, it might be maybe a mile. Cause see, because you got to repair them tanks and stuff because they have tank retrievers and stuff. And you take it to... You know, see, like, a lot of those guys... Uh, that work in the ordinance, they're like maintenance men. And they, they figure a lot of that stuff out themselves, you know. I mean, like to be a maintenance man, you've got to have common sense. You don't go everything by the book. Like the guy invented that thing on a tank when we were stuck in all the hedgerows. See, a tank didn't get through the hedgerows. So when a tank went to climb up over the hedgerow, his whole bottom was exposed. And that's the weakest part of a tank. So the Germans used to wait until the tank popped up over the hedgerow, and then they'd shoot you at the bottom of the tank. See, and the hedgerows, well, you know what a hedgerow is. The tanks, the only way they could go is inside the hedgerows where the brakes were. See, and so the Germans would have their tank destroyers at, at the end of the hedgerow. When he went along the hedgerow, he was facing them. See, they got him. So this GI got the bright idea. He got some old angle iron and he welded it at the bottom of the tank like a snow plow. See, and when he hit this uh, hedgerow, because it's nothing but dirt, dirt and rocks, see what a hedgerow is, these farmers over the years and years and years when they plowed their field, they'd throw the stones at the end of the fields. See, and that's how these hedgerows got built up. Well, when this tank would hit this hedgerow, it was just dig a hole because the weight of the tank would push these uh, knee, uh, fingers right through the hedgerow and it would make a hole. See? And that's the way they would uh, go through the hedgerow. Now, and, after all this technical stuff, okay. you're running out of tape here. Okay, that's enough. I'll say for next time. <laughs> I'm just asking you three more questions. Okay. Do you, can you tell me, do you think you were well trained, Sparky? Well, uh, uh, well trained, that would. 16 weeks. What can they teach you in 60, 16 weeks and three weeks later you're fighting? That's training. Turn peace down, Lord. It, that's like I told one time at a reunion, there was a Marine there. He was in there for 20 years. So what the hell do you do for 20 years? He said, we train guys. For 20 years? No, four years. I said, well, how come we had a fight after 12 weeks? He said, well, I said, he said, we train them and when their when they're four years is up, they leave. And they get uh, more guys. We trained them for four years. I said, geez, I said, it didn't take us long to win the whole damn war. You know, so I, they just teach, teach you enough to, how to pull the trigger and keep the rifle clean. That's, that's all. That's all they want. They even used to tell us in basic training, we can replace you anytime. Them rifles cost money. Take care of the rifles. We can replace you. So that, that's the way they treat you. See, you're just like I always used to say, Blood for dirt. See, like one time I even said to our lieutenant, I said, where do they get this here stuff? Uh, hold at all costs. I said, I'm going to tell you one thing, lieutenant. If they think that I'm going to sit there by myself shooting these Germans while all you guys are running back, I said, I got a news for you. Because when you're running back, I'm going to be leading you. Because I ain't going to stay there to kill myself so you can run away and them Germans can kill me. I said, hold for all costs. Let them generals do that. They're not doing nothing but drinking scotch back here. Okay, so. next question.
That sounds like a German, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, really you see my papers? I want to go home. Okay, me too. Um, but, you know, you almost sound in a funny kind of way. Because uh, I, I was. I didn't give a damn. Well, I know. And I, you see? almost sound a little bit like what they would say about insubordination. But I know oh. at the same time, from the things you've said, that you were a good soldier. Well, you I had to be. Is, were, you all, were you a team that way? I mean, there wasn't so much sir and well, not sir. Or, oh, no, you, we weren't allowed. We weren't allowed. If you, if you salute, that's a dead giveaway. He's dead. So you never saluted none of the officers. You didn't even say yes, sir, or no, sir. See? You could, you could say, hey, lieutenant, or hey, captain, or something like that. See? Our lieutenant, I used to call him junior. So one day he said to me, why do you call me junior? I said, because you're younger than me. He said, well, okay, I'll be junior. To this day, I still call him junior, and he's a colonel. So, <laughs> so, the junior crane? No, wine. Wine. John yeah. Wine. He's around. Yeah. So, Were you, uh, are you proud? Are you proud to, to have been a soldier? I wouldn't say I'm proud. I tell you, I don't even have a uniform. Uh, in fact, I got all my awards two years ago when Bill sent them to because when I got wounded, all my records were lost. And I got all my awards two years ago. Bill sent away from it. I got a whole bag for Bronze Star and that, uh, what, my uh, combat infantry badge and uh, what was it? The... Uh, uh, Combat stars for northern France and all that, Ardennes. I don't remember none of that. I mean, we were just fighting, and I didn't know where the hell we were. We, were, If you said we were in France today in Germany, the only way we knew, they had to tell us what to put on our mail. Like if we were in France, we'd say, right, somewhere in France. It was in Germany, right, somewhere in Germany. But we don't know if we was in Germany because they told us we were in Germany, except when we got there. Then we got in France, we got paid in French money. Our money was invasion money, France. German money, we got paid German marks. But it was American money printed for German money because it was printed in 1945. I don't say I'm proud, Bill. Uh, I just did because I had to. I mean, uh, I wouldn't want to do it again. There'd be a hell of a lot of generals in front of me if I ever had to go again. Because I told it. When we went back, we had a report to the draft board. And when I went back to the draft board, I said, what am I supposed to do? He said, we're going to reclassify you. And I said, why am I going to be reclassified? He says, in case we need you again. I told the guy from a draft board, well, i tell you one thing, Mac. If you draft me again, you better send two great big guys to come and get me because I'm not going on my own. And I tore up that paper and I threw it away. He said, well, you're not reclassified. I said, I don't give a damn. I said, I don't care what I am. I'm just not going back. So that was the end of my Army career. It was long enough for me. It was too long. And I think 99% of the guys that were there felt the same way. The guys that you, I'm not bragging or nothing, but the guys that you hear brag a lot are, are like the guys from headquarters company and uh, all the souvenir grabbers. They're the guys that, that tell you all what went. Because when we went back for the 50th anniversary, we had this old Clay Schultz, he was a historian. And these guys are telling, oh, we were here, we were there, we were here, we were there. So like old Gus, funny, I said, when the hell was you here, Gus? He says, 1956. I said, big deal. You know all about what the hell we were doing. You were here in 56. Where the hell were you in 44? Okay, stop. You know, okay, Next. that's enough. Next question. <laughs> that's well, enough. i got two more and we'll do Oh, okay. Um, about soldiers. Because, you know, the thing that I'm trying, we're trying to do in this show is not only to talk about what you guys did, uh, uh, you know, what we're asking them, do you think when we send GIs over there today, or, or when you went over before, do they kind of understand before we commit GIs what it really means we're asking them to, to do? Well, you see, it, it's a lot different in peacetime than in, co in combat, because peacetime, they know they're not going to get hurt. In combat, it's just the opposite. You don't know if you're going to live. But... Uh, I wouldn't say I'm proud of what I did. I did because I had to do it. I mean, uh, I had no choice. I mean, do or die. So I did the best I could. And if that wasn't good enough for them, well, the hell with them. Go themselves. Take my place. Are you supportive of the GIs who were in Kosovo and Bosnia now? Yeah. They used to... Now, you see, now, like those guys in Kosovo, they shouldn't be too friendly with those people because... You don't know what the hell those guys are going to do behind your back, like those poor kids in Vietnam, see? 
they're buddy buddy during the day and they're shooting you at night. So don't get too friendly with those people because you never know who's your friend and who's your enemy. The only friend you have is your buddy that's standing behind you. But don't get friendly with any of, the, any of them occupation troops. I wouldn't. I don't care if it was the Queen of England. I'll be damned. I, I wouldn't trust her because she's not American. I don't care how much of an ally she is. So you, you spent some exciting months of your life in Europe. Do you think it's some doing something that was important. Do you think it's important what they're doing now? Well, you know, they said it was to, to make them free. If they're free, what the hell are they still fighting for? Then we're giving them guns and they're fighting all over again. I mean, it don't make sense to me. Maybe we should have taken it over and run a whole Europe ourselves and run it like America. Because now look at those people in Kosovo. Where did they get all the guns? They didn't get them all from the Russians. Some got them from Russia. Where did the other guys get theirs? They get them from good old USA. Check them. You'll see. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But I bet you there's a hell of a lot of American ammunition over there. I, just like when we went there. I even told one of my buddies, I said, these guys are back for a rest because we were beat up. A little kid, about seven, eight years old, come walking by. He kept saying, bonjour, bonjour. And of course, I couldn't understand. So I called him over and I said, Parli uh Breaking uh, part of your friend say he says no. I says uh, sp sprechen Americana. He says no. I says uh, sprechen die Deutsch, and he said the all American word. You know, from no good. So uh, he says me Polak, me Polak. So my buddy was Polish. Boy, my buddy lit into him and started talking in Polish. And the more he talked, the bigger this kid's eyes got. Finally, after about five minutes, this kid said to him. If you're Polish, what are you doing in the American Army? He says, well, because I'm American. Well, he says, if you're American, why are you talking Polish? He says, because my mother and father were Polish. And if we couldn't pound it into this kid that he was American, we could still talk Polish. So we had this kid with us for about four or five days. He slept in a tent right between us. Morning, we get up and eat breakfast, take him right in the chow line. He got a mess kit. He ate chow with us, lunch, supper, ate every meal with us. After about four days, my buddy told him, well, we have to leave. He said, where are you going? We have to go back because we're going to go back and fight. I said, I want to come with you. I want to come with you. He says, we can't take you. Well, I want to come. But you can't come. You're liable to get hurt. I don't care. I want to go. I want to go. And so finally we convinced him he can't go. And I'll never forget. It broke my heart. We're walking down the road, and this kid's standing there. The tears has run down his face. He's crying like as if we were his parents because he just wanted us so bad, you know. And another thing, <laughs> I always get in trouble. So yeah, I'm always in some kind of trouble. We were in France, walking down this road, hedgerows. There's two little kids standing on top of this hedgerow. Uh, the little boy, he's giving a Nazi salute, and the little girl is American, because like, the little boy didn't know the difference. So she kept his, pushing his hand away, and he kept saying, bonjour, bonjour. So then he says, okay, stop and take 10. Well, this kid was on a bank right above us. So they called this little kid over, and he says, come over here. And he kept saying, bonjour, 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 monsieur, bonjour, monsieur. So I said to him, bonjour, monsieur. He said, yeah. So I said, bonjour, hello, bonjour, hello. He says, hello. I said, yeah, bonjour, hello. Monsieur, sucker, monsieur, sucker. He said, he couldn't say sucker. He said, sucker. I said, yeah, bonjour, monsieur, hello, sucker. So when we got ready to leave, I said, okay, let's go. This kid's standing on his bank, and he's going, hello, suck here, hello. <laughs> Our captain comes running over to me, and he says, what did you say to that kid? I said, Clarky. I used to call him Clarky. I says, I didn't say anything. He says, now, do you hear what he's telling all the GIs? I says, I can't speak French. He said, but he's calling everybody a sucker. <laughs> I said, he said, you, you must have told him, he says, because I saw you talking to him. So what did they do? They couldn't do nothing. I mean, they, you know, like one day he got so mad at me, he says, Spark, what am I going to do with you? I says, why don't, you, why don't you send me home? He says, well, I'd like to, he says, but I can't. 
because I was always in trouble, all the time, all the time. Everything that I did, always, everything the opposite of what they told me, because I knew they weren't court martial because they need you more than you need them. So. Right, and according to my generation, they can't send you to Vietnam, Sparky. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we ran out of tape. Okay, that's enough. Um, that's well, no, I think we ran out of tape just as I, you were getting to that thing about what you learned oh. because you were a soldier. Let's just do that, and then we'll be done, okay? What, what did I learned? What did you learn about yourself because you became a soldier? Well, I don't know. Well, I guess I'm proud to be American. If I wouldn't, I wouldn't be living here. I mean, uh, after all, it's my country. I defended it to the best of my ability. And uh, uh, if that's not enough to satisfy him, let him get somebody else. Give me my leg back and the blood that I lost, and we'll call it square. That's all I say. Do you think you're a better person because you were a soldier? Well, I I don't remember being bad whenever uh, I wasn't a soldier. I mean, you know, I mean, I never abused anybody. I never fought with anybody. I mean, I never got in any trouble. I was just a common, ordinary, everyday kid, like everybody else. Uh, maybe I might feel better about uh, being a soldier because uh, I know life is pretty god darn uh, expensive and. Uh, you just don't waste it, and you try to do the best you can with what you got and live from day to day and uh, hope tomorrow can be a little better than today and uh, wish everybody could be as happy as me at 82 years and the hell with the war and all the dictators and all the crooked politicians that make it. That's all I can say. Well, he got the last Perfect. word again, didn't he? Perfect ending. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. Oh, that's okay. I mean, I cut 90% of it off because once uh. I.